Good evening, everyone. Um, and uh, my pleasure to welcome you to yet another episode of the New Jersey Cannabis Regulatory Commission's public meetings. The time is now 6.03 and I call this meeting to order. As we begin, I wanna remind everyone that public comments can be submitted to the CRC during and after this meeting in writing via our website, www.nj.gov slash cannabis slash meetings. The deadline to submit written comments for this meeting is the end of tomorrow, Wednesday, November 10th. Ms. Hogan, can you please read the notice of the public meeting? Madam Chairwoman, this is a meeting of the New Jersey Cannabis Regulatory Commission. Adequate notice of this meeting has been provided in accordance with the Senator Byron M. Baer Open Public Meetings Act. The meeting, meeting was noticed in the Asbury Park Press, Atlantic City Express, Bergen Record, Courier Post, and the Trenton Times in April 2021. Information regarding the virtual nature of the meeting due to the COVID-19 pandemic was posted in publications and on the CRC website. The meeting time and location has also been posted on the website of the New Jersey Cannabis Regulatory Commission and with the Office of the Secretary of the State. Thank you. Ms. Hogan, can you please take roll call? Commissioner Barker? Present. Commissioner Del Coso? Present. Vice Chair Delgado? Present. Commissioner Nash? Present. Chairwoman Wayman. Present. All members of the commission are present and we now have a quorum. The first order of business is for the commission to go into executive session to discuss legal matters and litigation updates. These are discussions that are not shared with the public and we believe the executive session should take about 30 minutes. Do I have a motion to go into executive session? Madam Chairwoman, I move that we go into executive session uh, so that we can discuss legal and litigation matters. I second the motion. Great. Moved and seconded. Uh, is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of going into executive session say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Any abstentions? The motion passes. So the commission will now go into executive session. Again, for the public watching, we expect this executive session to last approximately 30 minutes. Uh, we'll leave this, this live stream running during that time and we'll return once the executive session is done. Uh, so we can expect to resume the open public session at about uh, 6.30, 6.05. Thank you for your patience. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for your patience. Uh, our executive session has now has ended. The time is now 6.51 by my watch, and we'll, we will resume the open public portion of this meeting. Ms. Hor Ms. Hogan, can you please announce the next agenda item? Next item on today's agenda is our executive director's report. Thank you. Uh, Director Brown, um, can you please uh, share your report for the commission? Absolutely. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, everybody uh, who's joining us virtually today. Um, so I want to keep this brief because we do have some uh, important business to get to and we have some invited guests and then uh, we'll hear from the public later. Um, so uh, I'm going to cover uh, essentially three items here in tonight's executive director's report. And if you can go to the next slide, I'd appreciate it. Um, so first, uh, an update on the 2019 request for applications for alternative treatment centers, then uh, a brief update on the 2018 uh, request for applications remand, uh, and then I'm going to just review briefly um, impact zones and economically disadvantaged areas uh, and uh, talk a little bit about the expected release date uh, for those uh, designations. Next slide, please. Um, so on the 2019 RFA, uh, for those who tuned into our last meeting, we did issue uh, awards in uh, cultivation and vertical categories. Um, those awardees, uh, 14 in total, have until Friday, November 12th uh, this week to confirm site control and that they uh, indeed have the MBE or WBE certifications that they applied with. Um, 
Uh, after the awards, we had an initial two day debriefing period. Uh, on October 19th, the commission extended that debriefing period for three business days, which concluded on October 22nd, 2021. Uh, a notice of that extension was provided to all applicants and posted on our website. Um, the first general responses uh, to that de those debriefing questions will be posted to the commission's website tomorrow. Uh, and then everything else will be responded to in advance of the deadline for those responses. Next slide, please. Um, uh, looking ahead to dispensaries, uh, those awards still need to be issued, uh, and I am uh, happy to uh, uh, announce that reviewers in, uh, in those categories have submitted all scores uh, to the commission for dispensaries. So as soon as they are compiled and audited by CRC staff, uh, a recommendation will be prepared for potential board action. Uh, we are trying to move these uh, as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, we know the urgency. Uh, we know that business is waiting and we know that there's urgency in the market to serve patients. Um, and so we are going to get these done as, as quickly as we can. Uh, next slide, please. So another issue that has come up uh, is the 2018 uh, request for applications remand. Um, and just by way of review, um, this is an instance where uh, the final agency decisions from six applicants total, uh, some of them had multiple final agency decisions. So it was more than uh, six uh, FADs in question, but six applicants from the 2018 RFA, uh, those FADs were invalidated. Uh, final agency decisions were invalidated by the court um, and it was remanded back to the Department of Health for further proceedings. Uh, when the commission was organized in April, uh, those proceedings were transferred to the commission, uh, and we fully expect to uh, conclude that process uh, and uh, have next steps there before the end of the year. Next slide, please. So uh, on tonight's agenda, uh, we have the uh, notice of application acceptance for uh, personal use cannabis businesses. Uh, and before we get to those, I wanted to cover um, some important uh, concepts in both statute and our rules um, that impact those uh, that, that notice and impact our acceptance of application. And one of them uh, are impact zones. So impact zones are defined in the law. They're defined in statute. Um, and an impact zone is essentially a municipality with a large population or a municipality that meets certain criteria regarding unemployment rate, crime data, uh, or mar marijuana arrests uh, or, and, and population. There are five different qualifications outlined in that statute, uh, and important to note, the uh, CRC cannot, uh, cannot change that statute. Next slide, please. Economically disadvantaged areas uh, are a term that were created by regulation, so it was established in the CRC rules that were adopted in August uh, uh, August 19th, 2021. Um, and uh, those are designated by the CRC through those rules. And uh, an economically disadvantaged area is a zip code uh, that meets the following criteria. It's 80% uh, uh, or lower of the median New Jersey household income uh, and uh, over 150% or 150% of the mean health insurance uninsured rate. Um, those, are, since they're designated by the CRC, uh, can be adjusted by CRC, but that has to go through a future rulemaking process, which uh, goes through a full public comment period um, and, and takes some time to do. But uh, importantly, um, those are established in rule. The impact zones are, are established in statute. Um, and you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so we've been working, uh, commission staff have been working to do the data analysis for these two designations so that we can uh, make results public and, and allow applicants to understand whether or not they may qualify for one of these designations, whether or not an individual uh, is associated with an applicant uh, is from an impact zone uh, or an economically disadvantaged area, or they meet one of the criteria related to those two designations. Uh, in order to do this, um, the commission has sourced the relevant data sets uh, that we need in order to do the analysis. Um, these have come from the census and Amer American community survey, uh, unemployment data and crime and arrest data. Um, we've not only worked with uh, publicly available data sources, but have also worked with uh, partners within state government to source this data. Um, uh, commission staff have built linked data sets uh, to conduct the analysis necessary to uh, determine uh, which municipalities in the case of impact zones and which zip codes in the case of economically disadvantaged areas qualify. Uh, and then finally, once uh, those results were, were established, um, the methodology used and the results uh, 
uh, have undergone a two-stage review. Uh, one is legal uh, with the Office of Attorney General to make sure that the analysis was compliant with uh, the statute in the case of impact zones and economically disadvantaged areas in the case, uh, or uh, and, and, and compliant with rule in the case of economically disadvantaged areas. And then the second piece is there's been a level uh, of data validation to make sure that the actual analysis was conducted correctly uh, and in accordance with um, what's required uh, with that methodology that has undergone a legal review. Um, and that was done by the Office of Innovation. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about the, the notice of application acceptance. It, it, these, these two designations uh, factor heavily into that notice. Um, and note that uh, we intend to release um, a list of both impact zones and economically disadvantaged areas after this meeting, not directly after this meeting, but certainly uh, in, in the days to come. Uh, those, those lists will be made public uh, so that all uh, potential applicants are aware uh, of what, uh, whether or not they, they qualify. Um, so with that, I wanted to uh, turn it uh, back over to our chair, uh, and uh, we do have a, a, just a, a, an important note for everybody joining us uh, about timing tonight, and I'll pass it over to uh, our chair to, uh, to talk about that before we get to the, the primary business of the night. Thank you, Director Brown. Uh, yes, um, we've, gotten, we've gotten notice that we will need to be, for those of us who are taking this uh, public meeting from, uh, from the CRC offices, we'll need to be out um, uh, as close to nine o'clock as possible um, so that we don't get locked in. Um, so while we will um, do everything that we can to make sure that we hear from uh, the, the, our invited guests and the members of the public who had registered to speak, we'll, um, try to just make sure that uh, we don't get locked inside. Those of us who, those of you who um, watched our previous meetings may remember a time where all the lights went out on us. So we're gonna try to avoid um, such fun adventures um, this time around. Um, now I'll turn it back to Ms. Hogan to um, uh, continue the agenda. Thank you. Next up on the agenda is consideration of the 2021 Personal Use Recreational Notice of Application Acceptance. Uh, Director Brown, can you please provide us and the public with a summary of the 2021 Personal Use Notice of Application Acceptance? Absolutely, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and, and just to, uh, to note, you know, uh, on, the, on the timing, um, uh, I, we, we always remind people that they can submit comments in, in writing uh, as well. So um, in the event, uh, you know, we have to cease, you know, at, at nine, um, there are avenues to submit your comments and we'll cover that more in depth when we get to the public comment section here. Um, so uh, when it comes to, in regards to the notice of application acceptance that's before the commission tonight, um, this is a, a notice that uh, for which the authority is derived from the personal use cannabis statute, the CREAM Act, uh, as well as our corresponding rules, uh, New Jersey Administrative Code, uh, Title 17, Chapter 30. Um, it, notably, the, uh, the statute, one of the core authorities that the commission has is to uh, accept applications for licensure, review those applications, issue licenses, uh, issue penalties uh, uh, for noncompliance, potentially revoke licenses. The, the, the issuance of licenses and all the corresponding activities that go along with that are core to what the legislature uh, has, has tasked us with doing uh, in, in our authorizing statutes. Um, so the notice of application acceptance, uh, it provides public notice to potential license applicants and stakeholders of the CRC. Uh, the, the CRC will begin accepting applications for personal use or recreational cannabis licenses on December 15th and March 15th, uh, December 15th, 2021 uh, at 9 a.m. Uh, for cultivators and uh, manufacturers and testing laboratories and March 15th, 2022 uh, for uh, class five retailers. Next slide, please. And this is uh, the timeline outlined again, uh, pursuant to this notice that's before the commission um, on December 15th, 2021 at 9 a.m. The commission intends to begin taking applications for class one cultivator licenses, class two manufacturer licenses and testing laboratories. And then 90 days later, uh, we intend to begin accepting license applications for class five retailers. Next slide, please. 
some important uh, inclusions in this notice, the notice of application includes eligibility requirements for all applicants. Um, it includes details on the prioritization process. So our rules outline that certain applicants and application types will be prioritized in this process. They'll be scored, uh, reviewed, and, and potentially approved ahead of other applicants based on qualifications. Uh, the notice uh, has all the application requirements, what forms, uh, applicants will need to submit, uh, what supporting documents they need to have. It outlines the scoring, uh, the criteria that applicants will be scored on uh, and what their uh, scores uh, needed to be approved are. Um, and then it provides some detail for uh, why an applicant uh, you know, may be approved or denied. Next slide. So some things that this notice does not include, uh, it does not include the eight, eight alternative treatment center certification process. So that's the process by which uh, alternative treatment centers serving the medical population can certify to the commission that they have uh, enough supply and that they have operational capacity uh, to also begin adult use or uh, recreational sales. Um, that will be addressed in forthcoming guidance that is not covered by this notice of application. Uh, it also does not include distributors, wholesalers, and delivery services. Um, we've covered before there's additional uh, rules that need to be done uh, related to those license types, uh, and they will be covered by uh, a, a notice in the future. Next slide, please. So the notice of application does provide additional clarity on some uh, key uh, factors. So one is local approval uh, and municipal preference. Um, so the notice outlines what applicants need uh, in letters or resolutions of support. So depending on how a municipal government is uh, set up, um, applicants may need either uh, a letter or a resolution uh, of support as part of their application. That's for annual license. Uh, applicants. Um, and then we outline what counts as municipal preference. So municipalities have the ability to uh, notify the commission uh, as to what their preference of uh, as pertaining to licensure is, uh, whether they prefer, uh, you know, a certain applicant over another. Um, I think the important thing to note is that we're requiring consistency between the two. Um, so if an applicant is issued uh, a letter uh, noting that the uh, municipality supports that applicant, uh, we want that to be consistent with any uh, any uh, communication of preference that's coming to us otherwise. Um, and, and we outline exactly what needs to be in both uh, so that both municipal partners and licensed applicants are, uh, are clear on what they need in these letters or resolutions uh, and, and what we need in order to move uh, a potential application forward. Next slide, please. Some highlights, there are no deadlines. Um, so we've noted in our, our rules uh, and now in this notice that we're accepting applications on a continuous rolling uh, basis. Um, that means that once we start accepting applications, uh, we will not stop until a notice is uh, amended uh, or there's a change in, in policy. Um, there's no limit established here on the number of licenses in order to allow the market to de develop um, and grow in accordance with demand. Uh, we are not establishing at this uh, time uh, or not recommending to establish uh, at this time a limit on the number of licenses. There is a, a limit of 37 cultivation licenses established by the statute, and that's um, that's prior to February 22nd, 2023, uh, which is two uh, years after the enactment of the CREAM Act. Um, and then, of course, municipalities can enact uh, caps on the number of licenses for the various types of cannabis businesses within their borders. Um, next slide. More highlights, uh, this is pass-fail scoring. Uh, so applicants need to get full points in order to be moved forward. Um, if a measure is worth 10, uh, applicants will need to meet the requirements of that measure to get 10 points. If they don't, they will get zero points and they'll be rejected. Um, applicants who are rejected, whether for uh, an incomplete application or, um, or otherwise, say they're, they have an incomplete response or, or a non-responsive response, uh, will be rejected, and then we'll have the opportunity to cure their application and resubmit. Um, the notice outlines all the measures by which uh, an applicant would be scored, and that's for the different uh, license application types. So there's conditional license applications, conditional conversion applications, annual license applications, uh, and testing laboratory applications. Um, and there are bonus points as outlined by statute, but uh, for an applicant to move forward, all measures must receive scores uh, in order to move forward in the licensure process. Next slide, please. 
I mentioned that um, the, our rules uh, outline uh, the ability for the commission to prioritize certain applicant types. And, uh, uh, and that's what this notice does effectively. Uh, the licensed applicants that will receive top priority are social equity business applicants, followed by diversely owned business applicants, followed by impact zone business applicants. Um, and then uh, overall, conditional applicants are prioritized before annual applicants. So uh, first, there's condi conditional uh, social equity applicants are number one overall. In fact, conditional social, social equity micro business applicants are number one all overall. Uh, and they're also uh, uh, social equity annual um, micro business applicants are, I believe, number five or, or uh, have the fifth designation uh, on the priority list that's in the notice. Um, and uh, uh, so conditional uh, licenses are prioritized before annual and then micro businesses are prioritized within every category. So for example, for a social conditional social equity business applicant, uh, a micro business will uh, be reviewed before uh, a standard business uh, application in that category. Um, bonus points also receive priority, uh, and those receive priority before just the general population of applicants, but uh, after impact zones. There are two paths uh, for to full licensure here for cannabis businesses. Um, and th this is consistent with uh, statute and rule. Um, applicants can come in through a conditional license application. Conditional license applications are uh, for a time limited license. That's a, a license that's available for uh, up to five and a half months, depending on whether or not it's extended by the commission um, and allows the license applicant to uh, get site control, uh, get municipal approval, and then file a conditional conversion application. Um, notably, to qualify for a conditional application, uh, all owners who have decision-making authority over the license applicant uh, will need to make either under $200,000 in the preceding tax year if they are, are filed uh, as a single, uh, single person, or uh, over, uh, under $400,000 if, if they file jointly. Um, but uh, conditional applications, again, which are prioritized over annual license applications, uh, applicants can submit their uh, go into a conditional license phase, uh, they can establish site control, gain municipal approval, and then file a conditional conversion application, which ultimately uh, results in the issuance of an annual license. Um, applicants can also come in and, and file an annual license application. There, they need site control, they need municipal approval, they need all those pieces in place uh, before coming to the commission, uh, and then they can file that application, uh, and that also results in, in the issuance of a, a, an annual license if they meet all the criteria uh, and are deemed uh, eligible to uh, hold, hold a license. Uh, again, with the priority, we'll be uh, moving conditional applications first before annual license applications. Next slide, please. So again, uh, the priority list, we have social equity business applicants first, diversely owned business applicants second, impact zone business applicants third, applicants with bonus points for collective bargaining agreements, project labor agreements, or uh, residency of five years or longer in the state, and then all other applicants. And that is true both for conditional license applicants and then for annual license applicants. Next slide. Uh, conditional and conditional conversion applications are prioritized over annual applications and micro business applications are prioritized over standard business applications in every license category. Next slide, please. So, you know, with this system, how do we determine uh, who gets the, the 37 uh, class one cultivation licenses before February 22nd, 2023? Well, simply put, it's priority approval as outlined in the rule and this notice, it's speed of implementation, and essentially the first 37 cultivators to meet all licensing regulatory and operational requirements and receive licenses in accordance with priority outlined in, in the rule and this notice uh, are going to get the, those 37 licenses. Uh, those, it, uh, previous slide, please. Um, Importantly, the, that 37 number uh, and that expires on February 22nd, 2023, uh, also includes any expanded ATCs uh, that qualify uh, during that time period, uh, and uh, as well as uh, licensed applicants coming in uh, through this, this, this process that will begin on December 15th. Next slide. So what are next steps here? So um, 
the notice uh, should it be uh, voted forward by the commission tonight, and it's my strong recommendation that it's uh, voted forward. Um, it, should the uh, should that happen, uh, application forms will will be made available on our website. Um, we will release the lists of economically disadvantaged areas and impact zones, uh, and then on November thirtieth, uh, we'll have a pre-application webinar. Uh, and I want to note that there were. Uh, a lot of people, I think over a thousand people uh, attended uh, the informational webinar we had earlier uh, about a month ago in October. Um, we received hundreds of questions uh, as a part of that. Um, we've been going through those questions. Um, our, myself, staff, commissioners, uh, we've been picking out questions that will be included in this pre-application webinar. Uh, we're also accepting uh, additional questions going forward uh, to crc.licensing at crc.nj.gov. Um, and in the notice itself, which will be posted uh, this evening, you'll be able to see that it, uh, you can submit those questions on an ongoing basis. Uh, if you want them to be considered for inclusion in the pre-application webinar or FAQs that, that, that come after that, um, you should get those in before November 19th. Um, but again, we'll, because we have a continuous rolling application process, we'll, we'll continually accept questions. Uh, given the volume, we're, we're not going to be able to uh, respond to all of them, uh, but we will be constantly updating our FAQs uh, and making sure that we're uh, addressing any confusion that might be in the marketplace and making sure that applicants are, are well equipped to move through the uh, application process. Um, next, next slide. So again, the full notice of application and license application uh, will be uh, available on our website. Um, the pre-application webinar is on November 30th. Um, class one, class two, and testing laboratory applications uh, will be uh, will begin uh, accepting those applications on December 15th, 2021 at 9 a.m. And then class five retailer applications will begin accepting those 90 days later uh, on March 15th, 2022 at 9 a.m. <clears throat> um, importantly, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll also note here um, that uh, a couple of meetings ago in our September meeting, the commission voted on a project to create uh, or essentially to, to establish an online uh, license application system. Um, so that will be ready to go. And that's what will open up on December 15, 2021. Uh, that license application system will be covered uh, in depth on the pre-application webinar. And with that, I'd like to turn it back to uh, our, our chair. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Director Brown. And uh, Director Brown, I have one question for you. Apologies if um, you did state this explicitly and I just missed it. For the testing laboratories, um, where do they fall within the um, prioritization? Yes. So great question. Uh, and and yeah, the, the notice notes that they, they, they get the highest priority, uh, you know, consistent uh, with our dual goals of uh, equity and safety. Uh, we wanna make sure that uh, social equity applicants are, are number one and, and we're also moving forward testing laboratory applicants so that we have uh, a robust infrastructure uh, of uh, third-party testing in place for as uh, license, license holders, uh, if they're issued a license come online, uh, they have labs that they can use, they have labs that they can go to and we can uh, efficiently move safe products through the marketplace to, to consumers. Thank you so much. Um, do I hear a motion from uh, my commissioners? Yes, Madam Chair. I move to approve the resolution approving the notice of application acceptance for certain classes of personal use cannabis licenses as proposed by our CSC staff. Okay, moved by Commissioner Del Cid. Do I have a second? Madam Chair, I second that. Seconded by Vice Chair Delgado. Is there any discussion on this matter? Madam Chair, I just have one question of uh, Director Brown. Director Brown, I assume your presentation will be posted on our website for the public's review. We will have public materials uh, for, for for review for for sure. You know, the, all the materials from board meetings are, are posted on our meetings page, so you'll be able to go there. Uh, the notice of application acceptance. Uh, itself will be posted on our website at the link, uh, the, the, uh, so you can find it nj.gov slash cannabis. Uh, and so you can go, uh, uh, potential licensed applicants can go there to get all the materials and all the materials from today's meeting will be available on our meetings page. Very good. This is a very, very uh, detailed uh, presentation. Thank you, uh, Director Brown. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? 
Hearing no further discussion, Ms. Hogan, can you please call the vote? Commissioner Barker? Nay. Commissioner Del Coso? Yes. Vice Chair Delgado? Yes. Commissioner Nash? Yes. And Chairwoman Wayno? Yes. The resolution passes. Next, we have the open public comment period. Specific topics open for comment tonight are the universal cannabis sim symbol, excuse me, edible cannabis and medicinal cannabis items and recreational distribution, wholesale and delivery issues. Thank you, Ms. Hogan. Now, uh, as the commission opens the floor to comment on these um, items, we want to remind our viewers that you can submit public comments during and after this meeting in writing via our website, www.mj.gov slash cannabis slash meetings. And the deadline for submitting written comments for today's public meeting is tomorrow, uh, November 10th. So please note that the comments that are submitted are shared with the commission members um, and will be made public along with the meeting's minutes. Now, um, today we will hear from our invited speakers first. Um, and followed by those individuals who have signed up to speak in the order they signed up. So our invited speakers will be limited to, to five minutes so that the, the commissioners, commission members um, uh, can appropriately ask any clarification or follow-up questions. Um, members of the public wishing to speak will be limited to, to three minutes. So Ms. Blake will call out the, the names of those invited speakers and and um, if you are joining us by phone, um, you will need to press star nine uh, to raise your hand. Um, when it is your turn to speak, Ms. Blake will ask you to unmute yourself. If you are dialing in by phone, which it, I do believe we have a few folks joining us by phone, uh, you will need to press star six to unmute yourself when told to do so. Um, after you introduce yourself to the commission, please indicate which item you are commenting on um, for our records, and then you may proceed. Ms. Blake, I will turn it over to you to queue up those who are speaking. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Dr. Hammond, if you would raise your hand, I will. Dr. Hammond. Okay. Just saw Dr. Hammond. Hi there, can you hear me now? I can hear you, yes, go ahead. Great, thank you very much. If you could bring up my slides, that would be great. Tony Ann, uh, you, Ms. Blake, you, you have the, I believe you have control of the slides. You can advance to Dr. Hammond's slide. Well, give me one, I'm sorry, I didn't realize I was, we're switching at this moment. So okay. give me one moment. If it's easier, I can also share my screen, whichever you'd prefer. Just give us one moment here uh, and we'll get these slides up. Great, thank you very much. And I'll move through these very quickly. My name is Dave Hammond. I'm from the University of Waterloo. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and just by way of background, I have no commercial or industry uh, interests. Uh, I do advise governments on product labeling, including for cannabis, tobacco, and food. Next slide, please. I'll just start with a very obvious statement that packaging is a very important means of communicating with consumers. It's particularly true in a legal regulated market 
which provides both an opportunity and a mandate for labeling. Next slide. Uh, there are different components of packaging and labeling, each of which has a distinct objective. And to be clear, the purpose of a universal symbol is to identify a product as a THC containing cannabis product. And the primary purpose is to avoid unintentional ingestion. So the goal of universal symbols is not to convey potency levels or ingredients or communicate health effects, but to identify the product. Next slide, please. Um, and of obviously universal symbols are important because we have both a wide diversity of products uh, and we have overlap with, you know, food consumer products, especially for edibles. Uh, and this, uh, you'll see, this is an extreme example of a product that has very similar branding, but it's also true of edible products that have different or minimal branding. Next slide, please. And of course, again, this is important for edibles because many product forms are inherently appealing to both children and adults. And that's really behind a lot of the accidental or unintentional ingestion. Next slide. So the good news is there, are, is there are decades of research on how to design effective warnings across a wide domain of, of consumer products. Um, at, next slide, please. Uh, and the science here is strikingly simple. There are two key principles. Uh, the first is that warnings must be noticed to be effective. And there are several basic design principles that change the likelihood of whether consumers actually notice a symbol. Next slide. Uh, and the first is color. Uh, the use of color as opposed to black and white increases noticeability. There are several good alternatives, red border, red, white on black, or contrasting yellow and black are both very common uh, and have been shown to increase noticeability. Next slide. Uh, regulations that require a minimum size, uh, larger symbols that are positioned on the principal display area, so the front of packages are more likely to be noticed. Next slide. As are symbols that have strong borders and contrast with the rest of the package. Now I'm showing you three examples of the same brand of edibles. They're packaged according to different regulations in three states. And you can see the importance of contrast when you look at the rightmost package. That's from Florida, where they have rules, medical cannabis regulations that, rec that limit the information to black and white text. You can see that the universal symbol is much more distinct than the same symbol on Colorado, which is um, uh, you know, less visible due to the branding. And the same is true of Oregon. Next slide, please. And the second simple principle is that warnings, once they're noticed, have to be understood to be effective. And the threshold here is that they should be understood by children and young children. Next slide, please. Um, and again, there is lots of research on symbols that even young children intuitively recognize, both the content and also the shape of the symbol. Next slide. And let's just have a look at some of the symbols that have been implemented in different states. Um, most rely on the word THC or the profile or shape of a cannabis plant. And we've done a little bit of work on this. And the fact is, is that um, children do not recognize what THC is, and most of them don't recognize that profile of a cannabis plant. So that content in and of itself is not intuitive or meaningful to children. Um, exclamation marks are common and warning symbols, but they lose their value or their meaning when they're presented in a shape that doesn't conform to a traditional warning. So have a look at the, the two examples on the right, which are sort of stylized versions of rectangles. Uh, in that type of shape, the, the exclamation mark loses its meaning as a warning marker. Next slide. And so I think, you know, New Jersey or other jurisdictions could have several options here. All four of these shapes have been shown to be intuitive, even to young children. Um, and they all have very high levels of recognition. Next slide. And you'll see examples, Washington State, uh, this sign accompanies the universal symbol. And you can see that it uses the intuitive sign of a stop sign. It uses three simple low literacy words, which is also important. Next slide. Uh, I would suggest that you avoid any overly designed or stylized symbols, which can be mistaken for brand imagery rather than a warning. Next slide. And this is being pointed out in Canada. In the middle there is Canada's universal symbol. Um, and it has a clear stop sign, but it uses an image that's similar to our national flag. And many people have pointed out it has similar to our national hockey jerseys. And I say that both in an amusing anecdote, but also a serious one. Next slide. And I'll finish by stating the obvious here, which is that 
Universal symbols are important for avoiding or minimizing unintentional ingestion, but they're not sufficient on their own. And some of the other packaging and labeling that you may be developing uh, in parallel are particularly important. Child resistant packaging, opaque packaging, so you can't see the brownie or the gummy uh, in the package, restrictions on brand imagery and design, um, some jurisdictions restrict words like candy or gummy. Um, and there are some jurisdictions in Canada that have actually restricted certain types of products. Next slide. And I'll finish with this. This is just a very simple illustration of the same brand and product that's sold in Canada on the right and Colorado on the left. And you can see the absence, the, the minimal branding and other information around the universal symbol makes it much more noticeable and likely to be um, uh, taken into account. Uh, next slide. So I'll just briefly wrap up by saying that the universal symbol should be recognizable and understood by children. Um, you need to ensure the salience of the symbol through regulations on size, location, and borders, and to think about how it works in concert with other labeling regulations. Next slide. Uh, thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer questions now or at a later point. Thank you so much, Dr. Hammond. Um, I will open the floor to uh, my commissioners if they have any questions. Um, I have one question for you, Dr. Hammond. Um, with respect to the placement of a uh, universal symbol, um, uh, you, you noted that placing the symbol on the front of the package is most important as opposed to the back. Um, does it matter? Is there any um, indication that um, uh, placement near um, or on the actual um, openings or closures um, of a package are more important, or is it closer to maybe the um, information about um, what an item is, or even at the bottom of a package? That's an excellent question. So all other things being equal, top of the package, and often you'll see warnings in the top right of a package is the most noticeable. Obviously, a challenge here is the wide diversity of packaging and openings uh, that you might have. Um, but all other things being equal, the so-called front of the package at the top would be considered to be the, the prime real estate for uh, warnings and other mandated information. Thank you. Um, Dr. Hammond, uh, thank you again for uh, sharing your testimony. Definitely uh, much appreciated. Um, you touched on, on one of the slides, um, importantly, you touched on restrictions on brand imagery and design. Mm -hmm. um, We've, we've also uh, received public comments uh, from prospective applicants who have expressed um, you know, unique designs and, and that autonomy to be created. Uh, how do we balance um, respecting uh, the creativity, but also um, making, ensuring safety so that, as you said, um, it is noticeable and understood um, to, to warn children and prevent them from you know, consuming any product? That's an excellent question. Uh, and I'm glad I'm a scientist and not a regulator because you're absolutely right. That is a question of balance and different jurisdictions have made different decisions. Um, I can tell you that the country where I'm from, Canada, has prioritized some of the public health protection elements. Um, and Canada, it, it's a bit funny, but they allow branding in which you can design the imagery of a certain size. Um, so it, you know, there are options. You could say, uh, we only want plain packaging, nothing. You can have a Canada style approach, which is to say you get a certain amount, but it has to be placed. Um, the actual rule is that the brand imagery can't be larger than the warning. Um, so there are different ways of doing it. You're absolutely right that it's a balance. I can tell you that consumers, uh, including in the US, typically voice strong support for restricting some of the marketing or promotional images on packaging if it leads to clear signs for health warnings and other things that, that actually consumers find helpful. So, you know, I wish you luck on that. I'm happy to follow up with you if you want some specific alternatives, but you're absolutely right, it is a balance. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ham. Thank you. I have one question, Madam Chair. Have there been any, and thank you, Dr. Hayman, for your input um, and your expertise. Um, has there been any um, effects to the extent 
possible of like folks that may not speak uh you know english and can yeah. understand uh, i don't know if this has been translated different languages like those statements yeah. i think um you know having a symbol um you know it, it's more universal um but i don't know what your experience has been in canada Look, you're absolutely right. Um, I mean, it's not an accident that if you look at the detergent or something else that there are very few words in most symbols, warning symbols. You know, the skull and crossbone is actually the most universally recognized symbol, including by young children. Now, there may be reasons why you don't want a poison symbol on a cannabis package. But that's why I would urge uh, whatever you decide, use a traditional shape and type of image that functions on its own without the need to read. Because you have young children, you have people that don't have high literacy in English, they may speak a different language. And I'll just repeat what I said before, but um, you, the words THC are not meaningful to your primary target. It may in the future, as, as we see more jurisdictions regulate and legislate, it may have more awareness, uh, but it doesn't now. So I don't think that's going to be helpful. I think you want something that looks like a traditional warning. And if you have any words, that's why I use the Washington example. You want them to be the simplest, lowest literacy words possible. But it, to be effective, it really should convey that through the, uh, through the symbol and the picture itself. Yeah. Are there any question, other questions from uh, the commissioners for Dr. Hammond? Seeing none, Dr. Hammond, thank you again for your time and your, your insights, um, very much appreciated. Best of luck. Thank, thank you again, doctor. Thank you. Dr. Nathan is up next. Good evening, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners of the CRC. My name is David Nathan. I'm a Princeton-based physician and the founder of Doctors for Cannabis Regulation. I'll begin by saying I heartily agree with the basics of symbol design that Dr. Hammond outlined, and I'd like to move from general principles to a specific symbol that, rep that respects those principles for the state of New Jersey. States that have legalized cannabis have implemented a wide variety of requirements for cannabis labeling because the solutions that are best for one jurisdiction may not be appropriate for another. Nonetheless, there is one anchor point that can ensure that Americans of all ages and backgrounds can correctly identify and exercise caution with cannabis products, a universal symbol on cannabis packages, and such a symbol is critical for all of the reasons outlined by Dr. Hammond. And that is why we created the International Intoxicating Cannabis Product Symbol, IICPS, homegrown uh, as a New Jersey design that is already finding acceptance in other states. Next slide, please. The IICPS has been included in the proposed rules for the state of Montana, and other newly legalized states are following suit. Also, the standards organization, ASTM, is actively involved in a process that would make I the IICPS the one and only cannabis product symbol in the world to bear the distinction of a consensus standard. Consensus standards are technical specifications issued by standards development organizations that may be familiar to us like ANSI, ASTM, and ISO. They're developed in an open environment through collaboration by professionals from both the public and private sectors. Next slide, please. ISO and ANSI have developed identical safety signs that are the accepted standards in the United States and around the world, and those same standards may be readily applied to universal cannabis product symbol. Perhaps the most important consensus standard in this area, ISO 3864, that you see here, defines five safety signs. For a cannabis product to a cannabis product symbol to be compliant with ISO, then one of these safety signs must be chosen. A symbol indicating prohibition at the top, mandatory action, the second, safe condition, the second from the bottom, or a fire equipment would obviously be inappropriate. The only logical option is the standard warning sign that you see in the middle. Ten, next slide, please. 10 US states and the nation of Canada have adopted nine different intoxicating cannabis product symbols. All of them have design problems generally pertaining to color, shape, symbology, 
or the prohibited use of text inside a graphic symbol. The ideal number of colors in a graphical symbol is two, and in this context, white is considered a color. As more colors unnecessarily increase the cost of packaging, and that discriminates against small businesses. The emphasized color of a symbol should be consistent with existing conventions in which red means prohibition, green means a safe condition, while yellow invokes warning or caution. According to ISO and ANSI, no letters, numbers, or punctuation marks, and that includes exclamation points, are permitted inside standard safety signs. This strict standard ensures comprehensibility of graphic symbols by anyone, regardless of age, literacy, and language differences. As Dr. Hammond said, people may not recognize THC as identifying a cannabis product if they're young, illiterate, don't use the Latin alphabet, or lack specific knowledge about cannabis. Thus, the use of the letters THC inside a cannabis product symbol is not just prohibited by consensus standards, it's also discriminatory. The next slide, please. The only appropriate graphical element to represent cannabis products is, understandably, the cannabis leaf. It is far and away the most familiar graphical symbol associated with cannabis. The cannabis leaf in the IICPS was realistically rendered to ensure the public's accurate identification. Also, the leaf was designed with well-separated leaflets that remain clear at small sizes as when printed on vape cartridges or embossed on edible servings. Next slide, please. The IICPS is uh, a design fully compliant with ISO 3864. Next slide, please. And also in keeping with ISO 3864, the IICPS is, is, is purposefully designed to permit the use of text below the symbol. So alphanumeric or special characters may be placed under the symbol for supplementary information. This allows for uniformity of the symbol while meeting the varying needs of authorities having jurisdiction in the United States and around the world. It obviates any purported need for the inclusion of letters, numbers, or special characters in the symbol itself. Next slide, please. You can all see uh, that last week, Cannabis Science and Technology published a paper on the IICPS that includes all the information presented here and much more. And today, we present the IICPS to the CRC with a simple message. This is not just the right choice as a universal symbol in New Jersey, it's also the safe choice. Next slide, please. The National Technology and Transfer Advancement Act requires the federal government to utilize voluntary consensus standards like the IICPS whenever possible. That means that any state not choosing an available consensus standard like the IICPS for their cannabis symbol is making a short-sighted decision that will require an expensive uh, change in their packaging rules once cannabis is legalized at the federal level. Doctors for Cannabis Regulation, the Cannabis Symbol Working Group at ASTM, and the New Jersey Chapter of Normal have all endorsed the use of the IICPS. We hope that, the New, Jer that New Jersey will join Montana and other states in supporting the IICPS as a true universal cannabis product symbol. Thank you for your time and attention, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Nathan. Um, are there any questions from the commissioners? Not a question, more of a statement, uh, Madam Chair. Um, going back to my previous point uh, on Dr. Hayman, um, my concern is, uh, you know, being able to not only uh, focus on the uh, the target groups that we're trying to, um, you know, target, but also, uh, you know, keeping in mind the diversity of New Jersey and 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 the leap is something that my mother, whose English is very limited, uh, she could re recognize uh, the leave and, and get an idea of what that means. Um, so I just wanted to uh, thank Dr. Nathan for uh, the information. I read the written testimony and if we have any follow-up questions, I will go through um, the chair. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nathan, I just have a, a quick um, two-part question or two different questions that are very small. Um, thank you again for your testimony. Thank you for sharing, taking time to join us, um, share your expertise. Uh, first question is, um, are you aware of any other 
um, applicants that are under review by the ASTM uh, for that universal acceptance? Um, I can tell you that there are none. Uh, it has already cleared the first of two votes uh, that the uh, that ASTM requires. The first was uh, a vote where any negative vote would trigger a, an evaluation process. And uh, um, out of the many people who had opined, there were two initial negatives that have both been withdrawn. Uh, I can tell you that before we started talking about the IICPS, the thought was that we would need to go with Canada's symbol, mainly just because it's the one symbol uh, that's used by an entire nation. Um, but I can tell you that that was quickly abandoned when we started going back to basic principles uh, of, of uh, consensus standards and, and design. Thank you for that, Doctor. And the second question, and uh, don't you don't necessarily have to um, get into any, uh, or rather, let me rephrase that. You don't have to mention any specific states if you don't want to, but I did want to ask um, how many other states are considering this uh, symbol in addition to Montana? So, um, so I would say at least three, not counting New Jersey. I can't tell you which states, except for one that has been public about their process, and that is the state of Vermont. Uh, they have basically decided that they're going to use uh, an identical symbol. They're deciding whether to use different colors, um, which I, you know, they're talking about red, yellow, and black, or red, white, and black. Uh, and both of those options are tri-colored. And again, I think that that's really unfair to small businesses who uh, may not have the uh, wherewithal to afford three-color printing. I think we need to keep it simple. And I think black and yellow really make the most sense. Uh, so Vermont is the one where I can certainly share their um, agenda, um, at their meeting uh, handouts that they had where they're looking at these uh, different options, but I can tell you they basically uh, have chosen this symbol and they're right now just sort of uh, wringing their hands about the colors. Thank you, Dr. Nathan. Are there any other questions from the commissioners for Dr. Nathan? All right, seeing none, uh, Dr. Nathan, thank you again for your your testimony and lending your expertise uh, for the commission. Really much appreciate it. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Doctor. Next up is Dr. Colello. Thanks very much. Um, I And thanks to the commission for inviting me to speak again on this topic. Um, I uh, am Dr. Diane Colello. I'm a pediatric emergency physician and medical toxicologist and the director of the State Poison Center. Um, and I am happy to hear, be here to talk. Um, next slide, please. I have no commercial interest to disclose. Next slide. And you know, the role of the Poison Center as cannabis commerce is developed in the state of New Jersey is obviously to keep our eyes on safety. Um, I've previously presented to this group that um, with increased cannabis access has come an increase in cannabis exposures, poison exposures called to poison centers and visiting to hospitals, both in pediatrics and in adults. And in particular pediatrics, we have uh, seen some pretty severe consequences. So I won't go further into detail for that other than just to remind uh, the group of the intent of this meeting, which is to ensure safety and understanding in consumers. Next slide. So how to protect public health and yet allow a variety of cannabis items. We have two goals really, as I see it, which is ensuring safe adult use, um, particularly to unfamiliar or naive users who we know are at higher risk of uh, cannabis toxicity, and then pediatric prevention of unintended exposures. Next slide. So first looking at the label, I uh, welcome the significant expertise as it pertains that has been presented previously on how to design a label in the most effective way. You know, for me, I think we want to avoid unintended or unwitting consumption by adults who may not realize they are consuming a product 
that has cannabis in it, and then to encourage keeping those products out of the reach of children. And then the lofty goal of Dr. Hammond, which I completely support, which is actually trying to deter those children on their own from using the products. That I think is the holy grail and is the most difficult thing to accomplish because for a two-year-old, sometimes a brownie is just gonna look like a brownie, but, uh, but we should continue to strive to make something look not enticing to those young children who we never want to get a hold of cannabis products. Next slide. So I offer here some suggestions that have already been mentioned. Um, you know, labeling science is not my field, but we do know from poison prevention messaging um, strategies that have succeeded in the past. So um, I think most of this has been covered. I do wanna emphasize that the label should convey caution and not be confused with brand imaging, which um, should, really should just be separate. I support the use of a universal symbol um, and want to pose the question to the commission about whether a novel or modified symbol might be incorporated for high concentration products, particularly in the, um, the medical cannabis side. Next slide. In addition to the cannabis warning symbol, um, just want to remind the commission we've previously discussed uh, what has been successful in other states, which is including the, the number for the poison control center in the event of an adverse event, whether it's a pediatric exposure and unintended overconsumption by adults. Uh, here at the New Jersey Poison Center, we will very happily provide materials at the point of sale if that is um, desired, including magnets and pens and all of the paraphernalia that we use when we go out in the public at health fairs and that kind of thing to educate about all manner of poisoning safety. Um, other messages may include warnings about pregnancy, for example. And then I just have here what Dr. Hammond has already mentioned a little bit, um, which is the cautionary tale of a label which may look better to a child than we think it does. So this green label on the lower left-hand corner is Mr. Yuck, um, was used by poison centers for many years. But really, I think in the field, we're not sure if it deters toddlers or entices them because it looks like a cartoon character. In contrast to the red hand symbol, which Washington, which Washington State then incorporated after you know, somewhat of a failed attempt uh, by the Mr. Yuck labeling. So that red hand is a lot more understandable for kids than Mr. Yuck. And then on the right hand side, you have pictured our New Jersey Poison Center logo, as well as the National Poison Health logo, um, which contains our number. And uh, the state of Oregon and Washington both have reported a decrease in emergency department visits after incorporating the poison center number on their labels because consumers can call the poison center for assistance and that may prevent an unnecessary emergency department visit. Next slide. So a, just a word about education. Next slide. Obviously the best way to ensure safety is to ensure that consumers understand what they're getting. Uh, we encourage use-oriented messaging, not abstinence-oriented messaging. And we want people to um, you know, receive non-judgmental messaging about safety. We know unfamiliar users are more likely to experience adverse effects, particularly as it pertains to the delayed onset of edible products. Um, and so that takes people by surprise consider messaging that talks about, for example, this start low and go slow, remind people about the poison center and conducting educational programs um, to kind of get that message out. The New Jersey Poison Center does a lot of field education and we would again be very happy to join that endeavor um, to talk about cannabis safety out in the public. Next slide. We were just asked briefly to comment on food safety requirements because at the poison center we do manage um, foodborne illness concerns. I have a uh, next slide, just a few comments on that. I think it's a common sense recommendation that uh, food service and manufacturer should, um, I'm sorry, cannabis service and manufacturer should have the same standards to minimize foodborne illness risk. Um, developing a notification system for real time alerts about recalls and outbreaks and consider implementing tamper resistant packaging, which we know is used for food. Next slide. Lastly, a few recommendations I have already made to this group, um, you know, standardizing the dose and serving size across packaging, avoiding these lookalikes. Um, and you can see on, the, on this label here that 
you know, not very well placed or effective cannabis warning label on the or symbol at the bottom of this label, and then uh, implementing ch resealable child resistant closures. Next slide. So thanks very much for your attention. Um, be happy to connect offline or take questions now from the commission and uh, appreciate being having input in this process. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Colello. Are there any questions from the commissioners? I just had a comment. Um, it, I, I thank you, Dr. Colello and the other speakers uh, for sharing this information. Um, it sounds like safety is a three-prong approach here. Um, there has to be education on consumption of edibles. There has to be responsible storage, you know, keep out of reach of children and pets, because no matter what the third prong approach is of labeling, it's still up to the consumer to keep these products out of the hands of children and pets. So um, I thank you for your messaging. It is very important for the safety of uh, New Jersey. So thank you. If I could respond, thank you very much. I think anytime we think about safety, it needs to be a multi-layered approach because that ensures that if one safeguard fails for whatever reason, there's another one in place. And we know that from, uh, from poison prevention and injury prevention as well. So thank you. Uh, Dr. Kalem, thank you so much. Um, always a pleasure for you to join and provide your expertise. Um, just a brief question. Um, you mentioned that the Poison Control Center can provide materials um, at the point of sale for uh, uh, businesses. I do believe um, that prospective businesses in the future will be required to provide some educational material. So I did want to know, would businesses be able to um, reach out to the Poison Control Center directly and get those materials? And if so, um, are they at cost or would that just be freely uh, provided? provided for free? Thanks for the question. We provide those materials free of charge. It's part of our program. So we are contacted by uh, many parties throughout the state, um, you know, municipalities, school systems, et cetera. And we would be very happy to have those products delivered to points of sale. Um, just we, um, there, there may be a small shipping cost, but other than that, the materials are free of charge. Okay. Uh, last question. Are you aware if any current uh, medical cannabis providers have reached out um, to get poison control center material to provide for um, patients? I am not aware of that. Um, and I, do, I don't believe that has happened yet, but we would be very happy to serve in that capacity. Um, I will say the majority of the exposures I referenced at the beginning of this uh, little of uh, this talk are not medical cannabis. Uh, that seems to, I think, be uh, have a safer storage and you know some different messaging. I think uh, sometimes people regard it as medicine, which makes it uh, less prone to accidents. So we've been fortunate to not have many medical cannabis exposures, but would be very happy to support that sector. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Dr. Colello, I have a question about um, uh, the products that your team um, is seeing um, being posing potential problems for, um, for exposure. Um, do you happen to have any insight into whether, as to whether um, there are certain product shapes, product colors um, that, um, that tend to um, entice kids or otherwise that, that tend to be, um, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, abused, or rather the, um, the, the individuals are getting some exposure to, to products based on their, their size, shape, colors. Do you have any insights into that? Um, thank you, Chairwoman. I can tell you that um, I can give you the anecdotal answer and I can follow up with the database answer, which is that I know we, have seen several cases of you know, egregious lookalikes in young children and homemade uh, products like brownies and, and that kind of thing. Um, and that has jumped out into our awareness. 
but um, I would be very happy to kind of delve back through our data and give you a bit more of an informed answer. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions for Dr. Colello? Seeing none, uh, Dr. Colello, thank you again for, for your time and your insights this evening. Okay, thanks to the commission. Good evening. Thank you, Doctor. Our next speaker is Rob Mejia. Good evening, New Jersey. My name is Rob Mejia. I'm an adjunct professor at Stockton University in the Cannabis Studies Department. And yes, we actually do have that department and we do offer a minor in Cannabis Studies. Uh, the comments that follow are strictly my own. I wanna jump right into edibles and mention two issues that other states are not even considering in terms of edibles. And that is there is a new class of edibles and beverages that have been manufactured to be fast acting. They're also known as fast delivery edibles. These edibles take effect in 20 minutes or less and are often more potent. They are an emerging class of cannabis product and they are gaining in popularity. Right now, edibles account for about 12% of all legal cannabis sales and will increase to about 14% in two years. In California, Colorado, Massachusetts, Michigan, Nevada, Oregon, Washington, cannabis infused beverages make up about 3% of the total cannabis market. Fast delivery edibles can include gummies, chocolates, beverages, and more. A consumer should definitely be able to tell that a product is a traditional edible, which we'll discuss in a little later, or a fast delivery product. Another issue that is not being addressed in edibles market is the quality of the hemp that is being used in CBD infused products. CBD oil that is used in edibles should be subject to the same lab tests that cannabis used in edibles are. Since hemp is legal across the country, product is being shipped from different states and there is no guarantee that the hemp is clean. In fact, if you start growing hemp in a field that previously grew other crops, it is highly likely that the hemp will leach pesticides, toxins, and heavy metals from the soil. Even a second year crop may be tainted. We don't want medical patients or anyone to get edibles that use tainted CBD oil. So let's just get it tested. And one of the reasons that an edibles producer may try to source hemp is that it can be 50% cheaper than tested cannabis from a state market. Remember that cannabis cannot be transported across state lines. So New Jersey edibles makers would have to use CBD, use New Jersey grown cannabis, but technically could use CBD oil from another state. So again, cannabis has to be from New Jersey, but they could get CBD oil from another state. Next slide, please. A recommendation I have for protecting public health is to develop an eight member advocate and advisory committee, similar to Ohio, that sits between the NJCRC and stakeholders slash companies. Stakeholders should occupy two of the eight seats, rotating stakeholders every year. This way, there is a trusted cannabis brain trust at the table. A provision should be included that members outside of the stakeholders cannot have cannabis business interests in New Jersey for a period of two years from final date serving on a committee. This is to reduce conflicts of interest. Also, use QR codes to show information such as test results, nutrition fact panels, including allergens, and include consumer education regarding dosing, methods of consumption, and side effects and warnings. By the way, I am in favor of Dr. Nathan's universal symbol. It is simple, makes sense, and includes flexibility via supplemental text. Next slide, please. In terms of food safety and cannabis safety, we should create an edibles operator license. Operators would receive training on safe food handling procedures resulting in a food handler's permit. They would also be required to take an accredited course on cannabis safety and dosing. Cannabis edibles operators would be required to get all health and local inspections before a safe cannabis inspection takes place. All cannabis food and beverage to be produced should be produced in a certified kitchen. Shared kitchens should be allowed to help social equity applicants and small operators like micro license applicants. They would have to get a license, take the same food safety and cannabis training, and would also be trained on SOPs or standard operating procedures for the kitchen they are quote renting. These suggestions are based on the Oregon model and this has worked for some time. Next slide. In terms of forms of edibles, I believe that determination should be left to the market. Some medical cannabis users will use adult use products, but they should also have higher dose options available to them. 
So for example, you may have someone who can use an adult use gummy uh, for their PTSD and perhaps a 10 milligram dose would be fine. But then there are other medical patients who would certainly need higher doses. Right now, the most popular edible products are gummies and then chocolates, baked goods and hard candies, and then unique items like chips, power bars, granola, and finally infused butters, oils, maple syrup, honey for home cooks. Infused beverages should also be allowed as long as they're accompanied by safe consumption information. Next slide, please. There are two keys here when you look at the medical and the adult use market. One is methods of administration and higher dosing. We found in the adult use market that 10 milligrams has become kind of a standard across the country and 100 milligrams for a total product. And that has been working well and that's what I would recommend for New Jersey. Also this product of course would be available for medical patients. But then for medical patients, higher potency 25 milligram, 50 milligram and 100 milligram products should be available. There should also be no limits or medical patients may run out of product by the end of the month. And remember, sometimes we're asking patients to replace opioids and opioids can be potent. So they need enough cannabis to do that, to make that replacement. We should also encourage the medical market to offer precisely dosed products such as nasal sprays, transdermals, and suppositories. Next slide. The first thing is to keep consumers safe, we need to focus on consumer education. There are two key mistakes when looking at edibles. First is consumers that start with too large of a dose. If you start with a large dose, you cannot dial that back and you are on that roller coaster ride until it ends. And the second thing is that some edibles consumers get impatient. It takes 30 minutes up to two hours for traditional edibles to affect someone. So you can imagine that after about an hour, some people might think something's not working. So they'll take another edible. And that is a mistake because that total dose, again, is the roller coaster that they'll be on until it finishes. I do believe New Jersey cannabis companies should allocate some of their advertising budget towards edibles education. We need to create transparency and trust. And obviously packaging should be childproof and should mimic prescriptions where a separate sheet lists directions for use, warnings, side effects, and important phone numbers. One issue regarding edibles is that a good number of users are over 50, and which makes it difficult for some of them to read such small print on a label. At a minimum, the number of milligrams of THC and or CBD needs to be prominently listed. Thank you so much for that. And uh, I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Professor Mejia. Do we have any questions from the commissioners? Yes, thank you, Professor Mejia. This is Commissioner Nash. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, my question would be, how important it is, uh, how important is it for the bud tenders to be trained in order to properly um, recommend a product to a consumer? It is absolutely crucial, especially in the environment where we are now, where even when some medical providers obviously can only recommend, they can't even prescribe cannabis. And some may know about some of the effects, but may not know as much as we would like. We depend so much on the wellness technicians or the team members that we do some kind, sometimes call bud tenders for them to walk customers through really the whole medical equation of how, how am I using cannabis? How can I find the lowest dose that's the most effective for me? What method of administration should I be using? So I do know that um, places like Stockton and then individual companies definitely train their bud tenders. And they do talk about the different products that they have. They also have vendor, vendor days where the vendors come in and they talk about their specific products. So that is a crucial part of the education and they touch more patients than anyone else. So that is absolute, an absolute must that they need to know their stuff. Thank you so much. Professor Mejia, I, I have one question about um, the, the fast delivery edibles that you mentioned. Um, do you believe that those um, items uh, should be treated differently or have different regulations uh, around them? Or, are we, or do you believe that they should um, be treated similarly to other uh, edible items in terms of packaging, labeling, um, and other regulations? 
I think without being onerous to the business owners, I am hoping that we can come up with separate packaging for the fast acting edibles because it is like a different product. And the big thing with edibles that people don't often like is it is very uncertain. And depending on your physiology, again, it takes 30 minutes, two hours. So people are looking for a more predictable experience. And so they're gravitating towards these edibles that will react in their body within five minutes, 10, 15, 20, but obviously much, much shorter than it is for traditional edibles. So I do think we need to make sure that the consumer definitely knows that what they're taking is different than a traditional edible and that it's going to interact with them more quickly and it actually might be more potent. So I actually see it as kind of almost a, um, a separate category and definitely it should be distinguished from a traditional edible. Thank you. Vice Chair Delgado, do you have- Yeah, so that's, that, that was an interesting question that Commissioner um, Nash brought up as far as the level of education that a bud tender or would have. Uh, Professor, do you think that it would rise to a level of, say, some kind of certification as a bud tender? I would think that would be something that should be encouraged. I mean, it, as far as New Jersey goes, you all are, are starting the steps of making us one of the most uh, cannabis educated states of the nation. And I say that I say that for a couple of reasons. One is that there is the required basic class that everybody who's in the cannabis industry has to take. Right. The main eight points on, on history, on chemovars, et cetera. And then also the continuing education that you have to provide. But because the bud tender position is such an important one, I would love to see a certification program to know that they do definitely know the different methods of administration. They know the side effects, the warnings, uh, because again, they, they really are acting as um, health professionals. And so I do think certification is an excellent idea, Sam. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Any other questions for Professor Mejia? Right, seeing none. Uh, Professor Mejia, thank you so much for your time and for your insights this evening. Absolutely. Next up is Ken Wolski. Um, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to address this commission. And uh, I want to congratulate the commission on the uh, mission that is taken on to uh, uh, create this new cannabis industry in the state and the progress you've made in doing so while also managing the medical cannabis uh, program. <clears throat> um, the CRC can best protect public health while allowing for a greater variety of cannabis items by doing exactly what it's doing now. And that is by developing regulations for the production, testing, labeling, packaging, and distribution of these items. Uh, this will ensure that the cannabis items are safely produced, periodically tested for cannabinoid content and contamination, accurately labeled, uh, because of these tests, securely packaged with appropriate warnings and distributed to adults uh, by licensed vendors. <clears throat> the CRC should quickly adopt dosing and administration guidelines uh, uh, to, and promulgate these guidelines to the cannabis uh, com consuming community and to the healthcare community in order to uh, uh, increase the safety and appropriate use of edible products. The Jay Koenig Law in 2019 called for um, dosing and administration guidelines and uh, education on uh, endocannabinoid system, as did the um, New Jersey Department of Health Executive Order Number Six report from 2018. Um, but we have not yet seen these uh, these programs, and um, and um, you don't have to reproduce them. Uh, they're 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 available. Um, a company called Cannabis Expertise offers uh, a number of these programs. Uh, marijuana is mainstream medicine. The medical cannabis program in New Jersey is expanding rapidly and the adult use industry is, um, will soon expose even more residents to uh, the therapeutic benefits of cannabis. So as more and more people experience these benefits, uh, healthcare professionals in the state must become comfortable incorporating cannabis use into the therapeutic regimens for their patients. <clears throat> Um, this can be done most effectively, efficiently by requiring education on the endocannabinoid uh, system for healthcare professionals uh, who have prescription privileges in the state as a condition for continued licensure in the state. Uh, the Jay Koenig Law also called for institutional caregivers, uh, that is to say, uh, individuals in healthcare organizations who will 
uh, take the marijuana and bring it back to the patients in these uh, institutions. Um, right now, it's almost impossible for patients to get medical marijuana in their institutions, in the healthcare facilities. And um, this is a, a potentially very dangerous and potentially fatal uh, uh, consequence. Um, I, I took part in a, um, uh, a death at Trenton Psychiatric Hospital in the early 70s from a patient with status epilepticus. Um, and so um, it's um, uh, something, a tragic experience that I've never forgotten. Cannabis safety regulations must work in conjunction with food safety re uh, requirements to ensure consumer safety in using edible cannabis products. According to the Department of Health, anybody who engages in the production, distribution, or sale of food to consumers shall have a cottage food operator perm permit or comply with applicable laws to uh, for food established food uh, uh, for retail food establishments. And um, so in addition to that, the sale of edible cannabis products should require a license from the CRC to ensure compliance with the production, testing, labeling, packaging, and, and distribution uh, regulations. Any form of edible should be permitted as long as the regulatory procedures are followed. There should be no arbitrary exclusions placed on, on uh, cannabis products. Marijuana therapy is highly individualized. Uh, the amount that a patient uses is um, determined by what is necessary to control the symptoms of the patient and anything that a patient needs should be available to them. Dietary restrictions should be taken into consideration for edible items. For example, sugarless products should be available uh, and not necessarily with sugar-free alternatives. Vegan products and hypoallergenic uh, dietary edibles should also be available. Uh, and public health and safety can be improved by making the widest possible variety of products available, including all potencies. Um, and edible products that are appropriate for sick people in the medical cannabis market are also appropriate for the recreation or adult use market. Public safety can improve not, be improved not by banning edibles and other high potency products, uh, but by regulating the use of these products. <clears throat> and um, important information that... Um, Consumers and patients should be aware of when purchasing edible cannabis items include the total dosage of THC per package, the strength of THC per unit dosage, the expiration date and storage recommendations, and special dietary contents if included. And of course, the warning package that contains, warning that the package contains cannabis. And in this, we also endorse um, the universal cannabis symbol that was proposed by Dr. Nathan and Doctors for Cannabis Regulation. So thank you for the opportunity to speak here. And uh, if you have questions, I'd be happy to uh, uh, answer them if I can. Thank you, Mr. Wolski. Uh, do any commissioners have any questions for Mr. Wolski tonight? Mr. Wolski, thank you for your testimony. Um, very elaborate uh, and thorough. And so much appreciated. Uh, my question, um, can you elaborate, you mentioned institutional uh, caregivers. Um, can you elaborate on that? Um, can, you, can you also touch on um, institutionalized uh, patients potentially? Um, yes, the no, concern well, or the, the ability to, to provide um, this medicine to uh, potential individuals in our state prison system or psychiatric um, um, wards. Uh, is that something um, that you can touch on and, and and also maybe touch on the potential methods of uh, uh, responsible consumption in these uh, facilities. Oh, thank you so much, Commissioner Barker. Um, yes, the Jay Koenig law calls for institutional caregivers who are employees of healthcare facilities who are authorized to assist registered qualifying patients uh, who are residents of the facility with um, the institutional caregiver will go and get the marijuana for them from alternative treatment centers and, and come back to the institution and, and assist them with the use of that, uh, um, with the use of their medical marijuana. Now, obviously, uh, it's not going to be smoked marijuana. It's going to be some type of edible product or oral product uh, that, that is, is used. And that's why it is so important to have these um, um, uh, dosing and administration guidelines along with the, the products. Uh, so that uh, the, uh, um, the employees will be uh, comfortable in uh, uh, providing the uh, exact dosage that, uh, that, it, that is required. Now, I, I worked in the prison system uh, for 22 years, and I worked in psychiatric hospital, Trenton Psychiatric Hospital, for four years. Uh, and I know these institutions quite well. 
uh, and and you know the staff in these institutions are are trained to uh, uh, you know dispense controlled substances to uh, uh, monitor the patients for um, uh, reactions to the controlled substances to uh, recommend uh, whether or not the uh, uh, therapeutic regimen should be continued or discontinued or increased or decreased. Uh, and, and to account for these substances. So there's really no difference between uh, giving narcotics in a state prison system and giving medical marijuana in a state prison system. Uh, in fact, costs will go down because uh, um, patients um, will have several conditions that are um, uh, uh, controlled through the use of one product, uh, medical marijuana, rather than a number of different products, uh, and they will have more stable patients uh, it's an extremely expensive process to, uh, to take a patient from a maximum security prison and transport that patient to an emergency room because of an unstable medical condition. Uh, you will decrease um, transportation costs and you will, uh, you will have a more stable medical environment by uh, allowing these, um, these um, uh, by allowing medical marijuana in uh, state institutions uh, like psychiatric hospitals, like prisons, like uh, um, uh, group homes, uh, uh, developmental uh, uh, disability centers. Um, this is uh, something that really uh, must uh, must happen, and uh, will the state will benefit from it. So, thank you so much for that question, uh, Mr. Parker. Oh, thank you, Mr. Walski for the for the answer. Thank you very much, Mr. Walski. Um, I know that you mentioned. Uh, a program called Cannabis Expertise, which I think it's the education of course that you mentioned. Um, do you know any states uh, that have used this uh, this education uh, courses and, and do you know if the number of registered physicians um, have increased in, in those states since they used the, uh, or they were informed or, or utilized the courses? As you know, New Jersey had some issues at the beginning trying to get some of the registered physicians on board, and I know uh, Executive Director Brown, along with former Commissioner of Health, Sharif Anahal, did a lot of ground rounds at hospitals. So I'm just curious to see, uh, you know, what the outcome was in, in, in those states that have utilized this, this program. Uh, well, I know that cannabis expertise uh, has uh, two-hour and four-hour medical cannabis educational courses uh, and that are nationally accredited with AMA credits. And these model, modules were the basis for healthcare professionals to be certified as recommenders in the states of uh, Ohio and Pennsylvania. Um, the organization trained healthcare professionals from 38 states and nine countries. Uh, the dosing recommendations and the training has been developed by physicians who keep track of every patient's profile and the reaction to the cannabis. So, you know, I mean, um, I have no, uh, I have no stake in this company. I just know that uh, you know they are one example of a, of a, of a company that. Uh, you know how to switch this to PowerPoint. Um, uh, uh, one example of a company that that provides you know this type of education on dosing and administration and endocannabinoid education for for the providers uh, in in that state. Thank you. And thank you for for your uh, written comments. Uh, very helpful. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Mr. Wolski? All right, seeing none, uh, thank you again, Mr. Wolski, for your time, your insights this evening. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Madam Chair, there are no more guest speakers. So we will go to the general public comments at this time. As per usual, each person has three minutes and a reminder that we may need to be shutting off earlier than typical tonight. The first person up for tonight is Tatiana Lofton. She will be followed by Chirali Patel, Ambra, Hassan Austin and Eric Sopko. A reminder, you will need to raise your hands so that I can see you. So that is Tatiana Lofton, Tarali Patel, Ambra, Hassan Austin, and Eric Sopko. I see Sharali, so I'm going to allow her to speak. 
Thank you, uh, commissioners. I know it's been a long night, so I'm gonna keep my comments just on point to the topics. And I, there was a lot of presentations about edibles, but I guess I just wanted to add and or kind of reiterate that on the package information, dosaging and just indication as to the onset time and effects, it really depends on the type of users, you know, whether they're beginners or you know, or they're habitual users, whether you take the edibles or the products on an empty stomach all of that matters. And so I think that if there can be some consideration to that on the packaging, um, also the, you know, the effects can take anywhere from, it could take 30 minutes, it could take two hours, all of that's depending on the dosage, the meal, medications, or whether alcohol was, um, you know, taken during the time or not. And so for patients, um, you know, doctors are usually more comfortable with recommending edibles and with the claim that it's just a safer method of consumption versus inhalation. So I think that the medical market at a minimum just needs, you know, access again to just a variety of edibles, tinctures, beverages that can help along with those warnings. And then just the recommendation to work with the Department of Health in drafting the rules that speak to food safety and processes. Um, it's useful, I think, to, uh, for consumers to know about whether chemicals such as butane or alcohol, you know, is used in the formulation. So maybe that could be part of the packaging label. And just to make sure that people actually read the labels Simplifying language so that it's easy to understand. Um, Ohio is a state that I will mention. Maybe that the CRC can just take a look at some regulations on the edibles because it's pretty expansive out there. Their labels are detailed. Nutrition information is on there, chemical content, um, as well as how much CBD and THC has been infused. So I just wanted to leave that with you. And thanks again for everything that you guys are doing. Thank you very much, Ms. Patel. Ms. Book, um, can you call our next speakers? Sorry, I was on mute. Hassan Austin has been invited to speak. Yes. Yes, can you hear me? We can hear you. Go ahead. Yes, good evening, uh, everyone. This is Hassan Austin. I'm from mtnbizdevelopment.com. I just wanted to make a brief statement uh, to the applicants, municipalities, and those grassroots organizations and nonprofits that help move New Jersey municipalities forward. Municipalities that opt out because they may not be prepared for the complexity of the cannabis marketplace in New Jersey, it's it's okay. It's okay for a municipality to opt out and reevaluate, among other things, how social equity will be realized in your municipality. Then, presumably, presumably opt back in, being more prepared for the requirement. Applicants do not overreact to municipalities opting out. Business development programming is a great way to demonstrate social equity in your municipality, requiring applicants to report predetermined business metrics like, like jobs or, or stock options or community reinvestment is effective. More importantly, business development metrics are an effective way to quantify social equity over a period of time. Municipalities should want measurables when realizing social equity in your municipality. This, this is an effective way to establish a success ratio over time when you when we look back and try to measure the success. That said, New Jersey municipalities, community organizations, and applicants should consider aligning for purposes to better realize social equity programs and initiatives. More, more importantly, this may help facilitate your support letter that you're seeking from your municipality. So consider, especially when we talk about the distribution of assets and resources that will be generated from this new emerging marketplace in New Jersey. Business development solutions are by definition all inclusive. Social equity is a very complex, but it, it, it requires an inclusive framework. So consider this when defining social equity in your municipality. That's all I want to say this evening. Thanks again, CRC, for the time, and I appreciate it, and keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you.
the next speaker up. None of the names that I, other names that I call are present. Uh, Cesario Stevens, Parker Brown Jr., Mohammed Zayrie, Carrie Ann McNeish. If you are present, please raise your hands. Cesaria Stevens, Parker Brown Jr., Mohammed Zarie, Carrie Ann McNeish. There's Eric Sopo, Sopo present. I'm going to invite you to speak. Hello. Go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Go ahead, sir. Oh, okay. Hello, my name is Eric Sopko. I just first and foremost, I want to thank the board uh, for all the progress you've made. And I want to thank everyone involved um, in legalizing uh, my medicine. I've been a patient now for over 15 years. Uh, so before it was legal. So I greatly appreciate all of you uh, more than most. Um, so my experiences as a patient um, at 12 years old when in 1994, I was diagnosed with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. By the age of 17, I had to have both my hips replaced because I was crippled by the disease. Um, in my early 20s, I was riddled with other autoimmune diseases uh, such as myocarditis and diverticulitis, uh, which almost cost me a lot my life um, when I went septic. Um, so I've been riddled with a lot of stress and diseases uh, my whole life. And in my 20s, I turned to a more homeopathic approach. I went to plant-based medicine um, I made a conscious choice to get off of prescriptions and just go with plant-based medicine. And I have never been healthier. My rheumatoid has been in remission. Uh, I went from 220 pounds to 175. I'm in the best shape of my life now at 39 years old. So I'm a true advocate of cannabis and plant-based medicine. And I totally agree with the lack of education because uh, most people do not know about my medicine. Um, and I'd be happy to educate them. Me and my wife started a, a, a education company, Plant Based NJ LLC, to educate people. As far as my path in my life, I've also been arrested in New Jersey multiple times for my medicine and served in New Jersey State Prison for three years. Um, so it cost me a portion of my life as well. Um, so under this social equity, I would like, you know, for my family to get some help in getting this licensing, because my biggest fear, I'm from Tom's River, they voted no. And now the neighboring municipalities, I know no one there. And you're giving them a lot of power, which I'm afraid is going to breed local corruption and give guys like me no chance at getting micro business licenses. Hello? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. So Sopko. Um, okay. And thank you for, for sharing your, your experience. Um, as mm -hmm. it relates to municipal powers, um, I'll refer uh, you to the, the, the statute that does give municipalities some uh, significant authority um, in, in regulating cannabis uh, businesses within those jurisdictions. But um, I do want to clarify that um, individuals are not restricted um, by, you know, unless you are looking for a micro business, you can live in any municipality and open up uh, a business in any jurisdiction, in any um, town in New Jersey. So I just want to make sure that that is clear. Yeah, yes. Thank you. And I would specifically be looking for a micro business license. Understood. Thank you. And I appreciate all your time and I appreciate everyone involved in this movement because I think it's very important to start the healing in New Jersey. And I think this plant-based medicine can start the healing physically and mentally because we all need it in, in this current time in the state of New Jersey. And I'm Thank proud you. to be from New Jersey. Thank you, Mr. Subco. The next five up are Warren Ferrante, Andrew Rodriguez, Sara Cuglin, and Lauren, Lonnie Afreem. Warren Ferenti, Andrew Rodriguez, Sarah Goglin, Lonnie Afreem, and Bo Futch. If any of those people are present, please raise your hands. Seeing none of those, oh, here we go. Bo Hutch is here. I invite you to speak. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm speaking on behalf of Happy High. Um, we are a micro business and we are unsure if we're going to be able to get site control in the form of buying a building. If we were to lease a space, would we still be considered for an, a license?
I'm sorry. Um, Ma'am, well, could you repeat your, your question? Hi, I'll just start uh, from the beginning. I'm Sarah, I'm speaking on behalf of Happy High and um, we're applying for a micro business application and we do not have the money to buy a building, but we were wondering if we were to lease one, if we would still be considered for a license. For prospective applicants um, you know, under the, the statute and, um, and the commission's rules, um, applicants can use lease agreements um, to satisfy um, uh, the requirement for demonstrating site control. Amazing, that's, that's fantastic news. Thank you so much. That helps a lot in terms of equity. I'm sorry, uh, Bo Hutch, go ahead. Hey, good evening. This is Bo Hutch from Georgia Mental Affairs. Hope you're all doing well. Uh, thank you again for your time. I know it's been a long night, I'll be brief. Uh, two things. Just want to keep flagging that, you know, you referenced that 2019 should be resolved in the near future as far as the dispensary permits. But it's uh, been a bit of a nightmare trying to figure out as to whether or not those individuals that applied in 2019 who have been leasing property this entire time uh, will be able to participate in a 2021 RFA. Uh, they don't know where they stand. It's Bit of a, been a bit of a difficult process for their uh, business plans, to say the least. Uh, the other big thing that I'm very curious about, and I know a few other people have been, is whether or not uh, any time the CRC will in the near future address whether or not we'll have uh, clinical registrant permits in this state. We've been wanting to do research for a while. There are entities interested in doing it, and we'd like to know the process about going about it. That's all. Thank you guys, and I hope you have a wonderful night and hopefully get out of the building in one piece. Thank you. Uh, the next five up are Brian Cooper, Brian C. Cooper, PhD, Donna Ross, Darren Chandler, Zach Katzen, and Jack Kane. Any of those individuals are present? I see Dr. Cooper, I will allow him to speak. Go ahead, Dr. Cooper. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you again for allowing us to speak and to register our comments here this evening. Uh, just a few things I wanted to ask. So I was listening to Dr. Mejia's commentary this evening. I agree largely with what he said about many of the products. Um, there was one thing that I would like the commission to consider though, when putting limits on the maximum amount of milligrams that are allowable in a particular package is that that will also increase the number of packages that would be purchased. So essentially adding to an unsustainable or something that's not really thinking about the sustainability of the product market here in, New in the state of New Jersey. So some states will offer things of like a 10 milligram dosage. The dosage size, I completely agree with what he said, but sometimes offering a, a maximum of 200 milligrams in one particular package. Also, I wanted to just state that I am against having a particular or a separate class for edibles licensing. Uh, I think that's onerous in terms of financials that would need to be paid to the state for licensing and committees, as well as adding an unnecessary layer of bureaucracy, which would need to be managed. And finally, in terms of the fast acting edibles, I think that was an interesting category that is a relatively new development in the cannabis space. Um, I think that it is a very important piece because one of the biggest problems as a person who is from the East Coast in this area, around the Philadelphia area, but living in New Jersey. And I lived on the West Coast for a number of years. And now I've come back and seeing how these products work from coast to coast. A lot of times problems with overdosing oneself when eating cannabis is a problem because of just what was said. It takes an hour, hour and a half sometimes to kick in. Someone takes a double dose and then they're in for the ride of their life. And that's not necessarily that's good. So I would think that having packaging that is explicit but it's nothing that's going to require an onerous amount of regulation or something that's going to have to be conformed to, I think would be useful for, from a business perspective. And I think as long as it's adequately labeled, that should be sufficient. I think anyone who's able to read can see a fast acting product versus the regular use. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. And next up would be Donna Ross. Donna, go ahead. Uh, good evening, can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. 
Good evening, commissioners. My name is Donna Ross, a 2018-2019 minority applicant for an ATC. The applicant evaluation for minority-owned, my women-owned or veteran-owned business certification measures, uh, that, that certification reads as follows. Applicants shall provide a copy of certi certification uh, S plural, issued by the Department of the Treasury Division of Revenue, which certifies MBE, WMBE certification, or evidence that the applicant would otherwise meet the WMBE, WMBE, WMBE certification. Applicants with A certification will receive the full 30 points. Applicants that provide evidence of meeting the criteria in the future shall receive partial credit based on strength of evidence. This selection committee shall take into account related entities for this measure. Our team provided photos of our owner operator team demonstrating that we're African American, i.e. Black, and we produce two minority business uh, entity and women WMBE certifications from the New Jersey Department of Treasury Division of Revenue. Our owner operator team is comprised of 83% African American minority ownership, three black men, two black women, myself included, and a white man. We produce those two certificates of business ownership for which we received a score of 20 out of 30. The re reviewers did not even give us points for demonstrating by photographic evidence and driver's licenses that were, we were actually minorities, Black owners, diversified by age and gender. The rubric training slide instructed reviewers should take into account related entities for this measure. And the certification only had to be issued by the Department of Treasury Division of Revenue. As I said, we've provided two certificates for two different businesses for two of our black owners. And the full 30 uh, points should have been awarded for providing such certification. Moreover, our proofs and our photo proofs should reinforce our status as social equity and diverse owner operators. And while that was 2019, moving forward, we would like to apply for other licensure, but the commission's rules don't allow me or my team members to qualify as applicants for social equity licensure because one, we don't have criminal records, two, we don't live in an impoverished area. However, we did present proof that 70% of our members and board of advisors are actually New Jersey residents, and three, our income is above the income threshold established by the commission. Despite being a highly qualified African American diversified team, descendants. Ms. Ross, I'm afraid you're out of time. Victims of the wealth gap, thank you. I would like to know if you're going to address this issue and or rewrite the policy to consider fulfilling the spirit of the law as intended, because it currently it frustrates opportunities for Black people to get in the industry. Thank you very much, Ms. Ross. Thank you. Next up is Darren Chandler. I will invite him to speak. Go ahead, Mr. Chandler. You hear me? I can hear you, go ahead. Hello, my name is Darren Chandler Jr. I'm founder and president of Premium Genetics, a black owned cannabis company. We were finalists in the 2019 RFA for our medical vertical license and unfortunately we lost. Um, to add to the to sister's uh, sentiments before, the, the scoring was extremely wacky. Um, but for the past three weeks, I don't think it's it's been asked publicly, but did any Black people win in this past 2019 round? Um, the data I found indicates no. Um, now, I know that the process is still unfinished, and I, I feel for the people still waiting for their dispensary announcements. Um, and maybe the data would change, but currently there's been three rounds 26 licenses and none are black owned. These licenses are the most coveted and most important to the supply chain. With that being said, what is the CRC doing to ensure black people are awarded the most important license in the supply chain in the future recreational round, i.e. the 37 full cultivation licenses? Now I'm happy that the CRC clarified that the the applicant priority order on today's meeting with social equity applicants coming first, 
But in regards to the second priority list, the diverse and women-owned companies, I think the CRC has an opportunity to flesh that priority class out even more. During the last public meeting, the CRC boasted that the 14 new awardees were minority-owned, women-owned companies, but none of the winners were Black. So there are and will be Black-owned businesses that won't fall under your definition for social equity, but by all rights should be getting the highest priority treatment in a diverse slash woman-owned business class. Um, the CRC has an opportunity to course correct this thing and set the tone right in the first recreational round because currently the market is not equitable. Um, lastly, related to the new application process, we need to clarify on some of these questions before the informational webinar, like how long is it going to take to score an application? It's a rolling process. When does the CRC start actually scoring the licenses? Are they going to start scoring it the minute it comes in? Or are you going to wait for a thousand applications to come in on day one? Um, will it be a digital portal? We have to hand it in physically. If it's a digital portal, I suggest that you look towards what happened in LA in 2019 in September when they released their digital portal license uh, process. Um, and lastly, how and when we'll know if the current MSOs, the medical operators, will start picking away at the 37 cultivation licenses. Um, and that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chandler. Uh, the next up is Jack Payne. Actually, Zach Katzen is here. So Mr. Katzen, I invite you to speak. Hello? Yes, we can hear you, go ahead. Hi, my name is Zach Katzen. I'm with the Atlantic City Cannabis Advisory Committee. Um, one of the things I wanna talk about are the uh, packaging today. When one of the great parts about the cannabis industry becoming legal and being implemented are all the ancillary businesses that come with it. Um, one of the things we know being from Atlantic City is that um, there are so many businesses that are connected to the casino industry that live strictly from the casino industry but are not gaming related. Hence the exact same thing with cannabis. Um, one, I also do work in public arts um, here in Atlantic City, and I can tell you one of the things that artists and graphic designers are very excited about is this new industry, because art and cannabis have always gone hand in hand. Cannabis um, companies are usually very creative in their packaging and in their design, and it gives artists an opportunity in a new industry in which to flourish. And we really think that we should take that into consideration when we're considering what needs to be done as far as packaging. We can walk into any liquor store and see an array of rainbow colors and those pack, those you know products are much more dangerous than cannabis and are typically stored in a regular refrigerator with full access to children. Um, so while we do have to be mindful about you know how we label and keeping these out of the hands of children, we should also try not to infringe on the packaging and the creative direction and this new industry that we can provide opportunities for artists, uh, number one. Number two, as far as edibles, I urge you to act swiftly because um, not acting is only increasing the, the sales in the black market and increasing the number of shipments coming in in the black market because they know that edibles are banned in New Jersey. If we're concerned about market share and taking share away from the black market, we're, we're talking about getting people away from who they're comfortable with and who they've been utilizing for probably a number of years. These people have the products that they're seeking. If the dispensaries do not have the products, they're more likely to not go to them, not necessarily just for edibles, but for cannabis and all other related products that they might be able to get at the dispensary. So, you know, while we need to make sure the regulations are proper and in place, we do need to act swiftly because we have an issue with, with that, but also with delivery services. Customers are going to be pressuring delivery services, their providers for edibles and asking for them. And at some point, um, you know, enterprising people might decide to pick up secondary products and add them in, and that can hurt this new legalization, this new marketplace. And I really hope we take that into consideration. And again, we act swiftly so that 
you know, we can have a robust market that covers all products and provides access for all consumers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Katz. And we will be taking two more individuals. And again, we remind you that you may submit your written comments um, on through our website if we don't get to you tonight. Um, the next two names are Travis Alley and Osbert Orduna. Tra Travis Alley is here. I invite you to speak. Go ahead. Good evening. Can you hear me? Can hear you. Go right ahead. All right. Some of my questions may be answered by the rules that are announced, but I'll proceed nonetheless. Is the CRC satisfied with the results of the 2019 RFA round? Specifically, is the CRC satisfied with the consistency among its scores and the diversity of winners, despite, the, despite having no Black-owned uh, companies succeed? Our company, 93ID, averaged a 90-plus percent from two scores on Team 2, but can only manage a 23% from school, 23% score from Reviewer 2. Had Reviewer 2 scored us with a high F instead of a low F, we would have won. Is the CRC okay with this disparity moving forward? I think it's fair to say that such wildly variable scores undermine the credibility of the process. It's reasonable for past and future applicants to expect the scoring to be, the scoring to be as objective as possible and, and as transparent as possible. How is it that a black and veteran owned company receives 60 out of a possible 90 points for, desert, for diversity, even though we're certified as such? For adult use licenses, how long will the CRC take the score applications and announce winners? Commissioner Brown stated previously that the CRC will not wait for applications to be graded for the purposes of ranking. Rather, applicants will be scored on a first in, first out basis. Uh, and the licenses are to be awarded right away so long as they receive a passing score. If the CRC sticks to this plan, it will be a great boon for diverse applicants and maximize the impact of skipping, skipping to the front of the line, making outcomes fair. I'm concerned, however, because the law states the CRC has up to 90 days to respond to applicants, which implies a comparative analysis between applicants to develop a curve. If this latter approach is followed, it would mean more subjectivity, more of the same results. I strongly encourage the CRC to follow through on its stated objective to award winners immediately that meet a passing score, which, by the way, also needs to be defined. You know, maybe it was in the rules, but I wrote this before that. I strongly encourage the CRC to clearly define the scoring criteria. For example, what, what are ties to the community? It's time to start letting true New Jersey-owned companies and Black-owned companies into the mix. I don't think future applicants should receive any points toward local ties unless there are at least 51% New Jersey-owned. Finally, the only group that should be able to get max diversity points should be at least 51% owned by Black men, the same Black men that own the legacy of oppression from the war on drugs, Let's not let it be lost while we're even having a conversation on social justice in the first place. Thank you for your time. And thank you for your comments, Mr. Alley. Uh, Osbert Orduna is up next. Hello, good evening. Can you hear me? We can hear you, go ahead. Hi, good evening. Uh, we're reaching out to bring your attention to a major issue of inequality that currently exists within the Cannabis Regulatory Commission's Publish regulations that unconstitutionally discriminate against service disabled veterans not residing in New Jersey. As you're aware, November, uh, on November 11th, our nation celebrates Veterans Day to honor those who have served in our armed forces. VA, uh, Department of Veterans Affairs data uh, shows that there, New Jersey has 60,000 plus service connected disabled veterans, yet only 150 uh, certified service disabled veteran businesses exist. A person is not born a service disabled veteran. In order to earn this designation, a few things have to have happened. First, they volunteered for military service. And then during the course of their military service, they were injured in the line of duty. Disabled veterans are people who have served our country and who earn the moral obligation of our nation to provide the disabled veteran a range of benefits designed to ease the economic and other losses and disadvantages incurred as a consequence of the disability they received in service to our nation. In 2015, the New Jersey Set Aside Act for Disabled Veterans Businesses, PL 2015 Chapter 116, established a 3% set aside for all state contracts to service disabled veteran owned businesses and defined the disabled veteran as, quote, a resident of this state who is certified by the Federal Department of Veterans Affairs as having any degree of service connected disability. This de definition is discriminatory. 
Disabled veterans are not just residents of New Jersey. They are residents of our nation who physically carry the scars and injury of their service and earn the designation of disabled veteran. To arbitra arbitrarily include being a resident of New Jersey as part of the official definition of what constitute who has earned and qualifies for the title of disabled veteran dishonors the service and physical sacrifice of every other disabled veteran in our nation and actually discriminates against non-resident disabled veterans. Specifically, the regulations contain language that discriminates against non-resident disabled veterans who are seeking to operate a cannabis business in New Jersey. We would like to direct your attention to section 1730-6.4, diversely owned businesses. Section A states, that quote, until the time that the commission develops its own certification process, a diversely owned business means a license holder that has been certified as a minority business, a woman's business, as a disabled or as a disabled veteran business by the Division of Revenue and Enterprise Services in the Department of the Treasury. This is exactly where the problem lies and where the inequality with the certification needed by service disabled veteran entrepreneurs begins. Simply put, in order to meet the requirements of NJSA 5232-31.2, the service disabled veteran business owner must be a resident of New Jersey, yet neither the minority business enterprise nor the woman business enterprise certification programs have this or any other type of New Jersey res residency requirement. In fact, MBE and WBE business owners can literally live anywhere in the world. Moreover, even a New Jersey domestic business that is providing jobs and tax revenue to the New Jersey economy and which is 100% owned by a service disabled veteran who resides in a neighboring state like Pennsylvania or New York would be unable to get certified in New Jersey. This is not equity and inclusion. Service disabled veteran business owners deserve to be treated in an equal manner instead of being held to a discriminatory, unconstitutional and arbitrary residency standard. When Thank looking you, at residency Ardona, standards in cannabis Ardona. and other regulated <laughs> industries, the courts have agreed that the, that the, the residency requirements are in fact discriminatory. Thank you, Mr. Arduino. Even, That's the end of your time. Thank you. Very well, Adam, we will submit the remainder of our comments. Uh, thank in you writing, in writing. Record. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it. Madam Chair, that was, would be our last speaker for the evening. Thank you, and uh, we thank everyone for their input this evening. Apologies again for having to cut the, the public comment period a little short. Um, as you saw, our, uh, the lights go out. Um, so much like the theater, that is our warning to get out of the building. Um, so um, we do invite everyone to submit their comments to the commission in writing um, via our website, www.nj.gov slash cannabis slash meetings. Um, and this concludes the business before us today. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn this evening? So moved, Madam Chair. Moved by Vice Chair Delgado. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner Del Cid. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of adjourning say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Are there any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion passes. Uh, thank you all again for joining today's meeting. Um, please visit our website to view information about our upcoming meetings. Uh, individuals can also uh, get up to date um, information about our regulations, the requirements for submitting applications, um, and a list of frequently asked questions. Um, will be posted on our, is, all, is already on our website. Um, and as Director Brown uh, noted, there will be a pre-application webinar to answer specific questions about the adult use uh, license application process. Um, and our next meeting, our next regular meeting is scheduled in December um, and our meetings will continue to be conducted virtually until further notice. The time is now 8.56 p.m. and we are adjourned. Have a great evening, everyone.